Thank you so much to Bethany and to Graham leading us in that hymn. I don't at all take those for granted. Those just really draw me to the presence of Jesus. That Bach playing. Thank you so much, Bethany. Let's uh, turn to this passage again, Matthew chapter 17, 1 to 8. We began to look at it yesterday, so I'll invite you to open your Bibles to that account. Matthew 17, 1 to 8. Gentlemen, there they are. Well done. <laughs> And six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and brought them up to a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became as white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three tabernacles here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And when the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were much afraid. They were terrified. Jesus came to them and touched them and said, Arise, do not be afraid. Lifting up their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus alone. Uh, yesterday, we saw how this text affirms how the unique intimacy of friendship can be so instrumental in our Christ-like development. And we talked as well about the contra-Satan motif that is so important here. And then we got as far as the transfiguration itself in verses 2 and 3. And now, today then, we want to pick it up again and now bring it to a full conclusion, round it out, so to speak. So let me just invite the Holy Spirit to really speak to us as these thoughts I've prepared might uh, find resonance with all of us. Jesus, we invite the Holy Spirit as you promised to be the teacher, the guide, the counselor, the one who leads us into all the truth. And we invite that even today that our hearts uh, hear what you want us to hear and respond to you. Give us wills to obey you and desire to love you more. In the name of Jesus, amen. Today, as we continue, the text, I think, certainly invites us to comment on three serious misconceptions to begin with. Three serious misconceptions spelled out in Peter's rather bumbling verbiage that is almost humorous in verse 4, Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. First, Peter's verbal contribution obviously highlights what I would call a silly sort of self-focus. Lord, it is good that we are here. Can you imagine? <laughs> You're in the presence of Moses and Elijah and Jesus. It's good that we're here. Self-focus. Of all times, you would have thought Peter would have just given his attention to those three. Lord, isn't it good we're here? I think one of the biggest detractors from 
Christ-like development is inordinate self-focus. When we think it's about us, I do really agree with Mr. Raleigh when he says to you quite often, your feelings may not be the most important thing. Oh. Now they're important, but they're just not the most important. When you get kind of self-focused. But I want to say about this because often I've found Christian Musicians in particular find this a struggle because to become a good musician, you have to give a lot of attention to private self-focus. The discussion last night about how much to practice. I had the joy of my last years of high school at the Interlochen Arts Academy and I had friends, pianists, who practiced six, seven hours a day on top of their academic work. And brass players, they can't come near that. We would, our lips would bleed. <laughs> but three or four was, was quite normal for trumpet players. And you're in a practice room all by yourself focusing on what you do. But if you keep the goal in mind, why? What d difference does it make? So what? like we said yesterday, because you want to serve the glory of God makes all the difference, but you do have to pay attention to the hard work that is private practice. But not like Peter here. Here we are, Moses, Elijah, Jesus. Lord, it's good we're here. Aren't you glad I'm here? <laughs> I just chuckle. What an idiot. <laughs> So first, a rather silly sort of self-focus gets in the way of your spiritual development, I have to say. A lot of the Christianity I see is very selfish. And it keeps you from serving Christ as he would want you to. Second, this is also undoubtedly highlights this passage, our human tendency to religious enshrining that is, institutionalizing Jesus with religious categories. Peter's comment, I will build three shelters, box you in, encapsulate you, institutionalize you, put you in my category where you belong. I will build three shelters, one for you, Jesus. And, of course, one for Moses and one for Elijah. <clears throat> Moses representing God's giving the law, Elijah, the prophets, and all they had to say, we'll institutionalize them. We should not fail to note Peter's use of the term skenes, translated shelters or some versions tabernacles. I will build a tabernacle for you. That certainly invokes good, solid Jewish traditionalism that suggests the Feast of Booths and also the remembrance of Exodus, both suggested by the presence of Moses here in this account. Now, of course, we can give Peter the benefit of the doubt and concur that he probably meant well. But it still, nonetheless, is an obvious example of the boxing in tendencies that are demonstrably inherent in religion and human constructs of systematics. There's whole divisions and theological schools devoted to systematic theology. And I have to tell you, I'm quite wary of it. It comes from various cultures, various traditions, but I don't really think it's healthy to try to systematize God too much. Now, I understand why that happens, but let's just say I'm a wary of it. We could talk about that over coffee, <laughs> if you buy. <clears throat> 
the categories of religious interpretation that humans love to construct, human constructs of systems that actually end up, in many cases, limiting Jesus in our attempts to define him in accord with pre-existing traditions like tabernacles and shelters and feast of booths and exodus, good as all that is, then we can box it in and understand it, we think. And third, last of course, most important, I think, is the very serious error displayed in this perhaps well-meant attempt of Peter, but which nonetheless amounts to simply equating Jesus Christ with a variety of other religious figures or areas of importance. Certainly the point a point, a critical point of this Transfiguration Mountain episode is to make glaringly clear that Jesus Christ supersedes Moses, supersedes Elijah, supersedes Gandhi, supersedes Muhammad supersedes the favorite heroes in your life. <clears throat> Foolish Peter, this Jesus is not to be equated with them, each in their nice wee little shrine. You get one Jesus along with them. We just equate them. Foolish Peter, this Jesus is not to be equated with anything else as though of equal or even, sadly for many people, lesser value. Dear young women, young men, teachers, staff, this confronts each of us likewise with, I think, a rather gripping question. Are we as well treating this Jesus, this transfigured one, as though he is simply on a par with other competing contingencies in our lives? Does Jesus compete in your life for your affection? Does Jesus compete in your life for your devotion? Does Jesus compete in your life with your fondest relationships, friends, loved ones, even romantic relationships? Does Jesus Christ need to compete in your life for your best laid plans, aspirations, your goals? Are we treating this Jesus, this transfigured one, as though he is simply on a par with other loyalties, other lords who persuade us actually into idolatry when they go above Jesus Christ? That's idolatry. So as we did yesterday, I want to take a moment right now and just invite you for a silent reflection to think about the weight of that. Is Jesus competing with some area of your life? This transfiguration story is meant to say he supersedes it all, or he ought to, if you get this vision. So just a moment, just to be quiet and let that say, Lord, show me. Is Jesus having to compete with my affections?
as this account goes on, this is why, of course, as we come to verse 5, God the Father only at this point now enters this conversation. Verse 5, while he was still speaking, Peter blabbering on, while he was still speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Thus it is more than likely that God's tone here was anything but genteel but if anything, angry and frustrated. We must, after all, note how Matthew makes clear that God's voice enters by way of interruption. While he was still speaking, God rudely interrupts Peter. The text says specifically in verse 5, there is a note of agitation here. There is a clear tone of exasperation here. I think God is minimally perturbed and so declares that Jesus is not to be equated with any others. This is my son. Utos esten hob wios mu. My son. Ho agapetos, the one I love. And ho yudo kesad, and I am so pleased in him. Ho wios mu, my son. It is a huge statement affirming Trinitarian love and pleasure that define the Son, Jesus our Lord. He is distinctively different than anyone else. This is my son. Not Trinitarian economic roles or Trinitarian duty or even a calculating call for the son for sacrifice and martyrdom. But at the deepest level, at the being level, this affirmation from the Father maintains the absolute uniqueness of Christ who is the very Son of God in the beauty of this Trinitarian relationship of love and, in fact, pleasure-taking, whom I am so well pleased in. God finds such pleasure in the Son. And based upon this absolute uniqueness of Jesus Christ, do you know what God, I think, is essentially saying to Peter? Could be a very important theological truth. I think he's essentially saying, shut up and listen. Shut up. Lord, isn't it good that we're here? I'll build you a shrine. God says, shut up. This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him and close your mouth. When I was about your age, and really first came to know Jesus Christ through Chehi, the influence of Chehi friends, I had something to say about everything. I talked a lot. I gave my opinion about every sort of debate, mainly Bible, God, Jesus. But you know, as I get older, I'm learning to just shut up, 
Just listen. I think one of the best exercises for spiritual development is to shut your mouth, be quiet, and listen for the voice of the Spirit. Listen for God's voice that will say, this, this is my son, listen to him. This grand message of the Transfiguration account to you and me as well comes down to listen to Christ, obey Christ, follow Christ. Your words, your ideas, your feelings are only secondarily important. Don't get me wrong, God loves them like He loves the Son, but they are secondary to the Son. And you will show maturity when you speak less and listen more to the Spirit of God. And so all of this is what lies behind this response of these three disciples when they fell face down to the ground. All this run-up, the unique trio friendship, intimacy of friends, the contra Satan motif, the transfiguration itself and the verbal bumbling of Peter in which God confronts, listen to Jesus. All of that is what lies behind the real apex of this passage, verse 6. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground and were terrified. <clears throat> Did you know that the most common word for worship in the New Testament, like its Old Testament counterpart, means literally to kiss the ground? Avar in its corollary, corollary, shetach in Hebrew, to go prostrate, to kiss the ground out of reverence for God. And in the New Testament, proskuneo, the very term to go prostrate, proskuneo, to kiss the ground. Our very polite and proper and staid worship styles would have been so strange to the Hebrews and the early followers of Jesus who would say, if you are worshiping God, lie flat on your face and kiss the ground. Worship is what happened here. And this text is not at all embarrassed to say it is most often accompanied by something we don't like to see, but it says it as clear as day. It's accompanied by a healthy fear. They were terrified. I think there's a place to come before God. with fear, healthy fear, healthy reverential awe. And say, there's something terrifying about the presence of God. He is holy, he's majestic, he's powerful. These disciples went fully prostrate with their faces in the dirt, kissing the ground in the full grip of awe and worship and even holy fear.
One piece of tool that I would recommend for good worship <coughs> is a good sturdy set of overalls. I learned that when five or six years ago I was invited to preach at the church where a very famous preacher, Bible expositor and writer preached for many years earlier in the last century. His name was A.W. Tozer. If you heard of him, read his books, The Knowledge, Pursuit of God, The Pursuit of Holy, the Holy, Incredibly Root of Righteousness, amazing writing. I was invited to go preach in his Southside Church, Southside Chicago. And I went, of course, early, and some of the leaders of the church wanted to show me, and they took me down in the basement, not just the basement, but way back where A.W. Tozer's office was, and behind it was the boiler room, dirty, scuzzy, cobwebs, and all that sort of stuff. And on the wall, hanging on a nail, was a set of overalls that had A.W. Tozer in the label. And they said, you know, Tozer came every day and his first action early in the morning was to put on overalls because back then when you were a pastor you wore a suit and tie. And he'd cover up his nice suit and in the boiler room lay prostrate, his face in the ground to worship God. If you want to worship well, get a good pair of overalls. Get to know Jesus in such a way that your best response is to put your face in the dirt. This passage ends with a hugely necessary denouement to this powerful biblical account which we conclude. In verse 7, two absolutely critical final results, the touch of Jesus and the removal of fear. Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said, don't be afraid. And here, I think, is the so what of such high Christology we find here in this magnificent transfiguration account. Here is the real nitty-gritty so what. Christian worship eventuates in listening intently to Christ above all. The touch of Christ upon you in worship and the removal of fear except the holy kind that is reverential and awe-giving. That is what happens when we consider Jesus again and again and again every time we worship. I remember there was a rather... Uh, strongly opinionated young man at Chehi one year. We became good friends even though he was rather obnoxious. I won't tell you his name. <laughs> you might know him or he might come to visit, but I remember one time he said to me, you know, he was trying to expound on how Jesus is just your, your best, your best bud your compadre. He said, you know, if Jesus walked into this room right now, Wes, I'd just run up to him, throw my arms around his shoulder and say, come on, buddy, let's take on the world. I don't believe that for an instant. If Jesus Christ walked through these doors right now into this room, 
the awesomeness of his majesty, the power of his presence, the light of his eternal being, I think would be so overwhelming that every one of us would fall flat on our faces, prostrate before him, kissing the ground with holy reverence, holy fear. He was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments were as white as light. I challenge you today to do one thing today. I'm not, this is not a gimmick. I mean this. I will do it. Find some point where you put your face on the floor. Just try it. Try to be Hebrew. Try to be early New Testament. Put your face on the floor and envision Jesus Christ. But now I'm not going to ask you to do that together. We're going to stand and sing. Crown him with many crowns. Let's sing. Jesus, thank you for this text and the majesty of Christ. And help us to become worshipers who purchase a good set of overalls. In the name of Jesus, amen.